Every now and again, I'll give you something from Larry Lilly. I like Larry Lilly. I heard a man pray, Lord, please deliver us from the spirit. Yeah, just take two of them. I heard a man pray, Lord, please deliver us from the spirit of apathy. This is a good and appropriate prayer for most groups and 99% of individuals, especially those who profess to be Christians. I know that each day I pray and use other tools to help me overcome the spirit of apathy. Apathy is described as an absence or lack of feeling, a freedom from passion, excitement, or emotion. Passion, excitement, and intense feeling makes the difference in any area of life, most assuredly in the field in which I labor and in all lesser endeavors. I stated the phrase exactly as intended, for in the field to which I am called, what could possibly be more important than to communicate the truth of God's love and that with feeling. One commenter on the passing scene noted the tragedy of our time by stating that actors pretend fiction is real and do it with passion while the clergy take the grandest of all truth and speak of it as though it was mere fiction and do this without feeling. The service rendered to the Lord by 90% of professing children of God is done so without thought or feeling, but simply a performance of duty. In my travels, I talked to 21 men and women over the last year who told me the only reason they continue at the place of worship they now attend is due to the fact that they are leaders. I have lost track of the multitudes of men and women who in time past were filled with the knowledge and zeal of Jesus but upon who cooling off simply withered up and died to the things of Jesus. Their seat is empty at the house of prayer. Much of the effort put forth by the saints is rendered in vain, for it is given with little or no feeling. The targets of, the emp of this effort excuse me, sense this apathy and deeply resent such affront. We all have been to some sort of competition and became the little sickened when a member of the team simply goes through the motions with no intensity and no feeling. I have heard men read the 23rd Psalm in such an apathetic style that it put the listeners in a trance, and other men have read a grocery list with passion and brought tears to the eyes of the ears. You have no idea the sacrifice a head of lettuce has made for you. One divine postulated that we are in the Laodicean age. I think stage would be more on target. But the good man meant that the professing Christians at the present are lukewarm, as this is what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. Notice his exact rebuke, Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. If you take serve out of service, you have ice left. Larry the Younger. Hmm. How many times do you just go through the motion? Oh, I got to go on visitation tonight. Yeah. Hmm. Do you have a passion for souls? Do you, do you believe in heaven and hell? I mean, we all sit here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if I went to each of you and said, Kevin, do you believe in heaven and hell? Do you really believe there's a heaven? Do you really believe there's a hell? Hmm? None of us sitting here are going to go, I oh, no. The little kids sing a song. Yeah. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Do you believe there's a heaven or a hell? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have any tracks in your pocket? Did you witness to somebody yesterday? My schedule. You, know. you don't believe there's a heaven and a hell. You don't. 
If you believe there was a heaven and a hell, you know what you would be doing? Man, you had a lost loved one. <laughs> hmm. See, if you knew somebody that was lost, But oh, we we believe. I'm a biblical literalist. I believe the Bible. I go to a good church. Yeah, but you don't care if the people around you die and go to hell. It just doesn't matter. When's the last time you prayed weeping for a lost person? Wow, well, come on, Dr. Lewis, you just been you know, You're a silly old man. Really? My family cried and wept for me until I got saved. I've cried and wept over my father and I saw him get saved. Brother George. Yes. Yes. I, I understand what you mean, brother. Believe me. I know regrets in my witnessing time. Yeah. But think about this, brother George. What if you hadn't witnessed to him? Or what if? Well, yeah, you know, I've given him a gospel track. I've witnessed to him, but yeah, then I, I still didn't listen to his dirty joke, or, uh, you know, I did this or I did that. And, uh, yeah, you know, ain't my fault he didn't get saved. It ain't. It isn't. Tell me that. Tell me that isn't your fault. Apathy. Don't care. But I do care, Dr. Lewis. Really? Who'd you witness to yesterday? Tell me you cared and then tell me who you witnessed to. But, but I'm just so busy. Yeah, Brother George. I learned too, Dr. Lewis, you can really only have true compassion when you're looking at someone's face. Amen. The girl sang it in chapel Tuesday. Amen? You got to touch the world. Now, you, you were not in the world. I mean, you know what I mean. But when's the last time you actually you saw the lost? That's part of it, man. When's the last time you actually saw the lost? I mean, look someone dead in the face and know that they're getting ready to go to hell and spend an eternity where the flames never quenched, the worm dieth not. And you're going to stand there with their blood on your hands. Remember the little girl? That was apathy. It was other concerns. Things are more important. Well, don't get me wrong. I, man, I wish I was as I wish I was better. Oh Lord, give me more of a burden. Don't pay at the pump. Don't pay at the pump. Jim, you can walk in there. It ain't gonna hurt you to walk a couple of feet so you can give him a track. But we're in a hurry. Am I? Yeah, I got a schedule to keep. I got places I got to go. You don't care. I don't care. Whenever I don't give them a track, whenever I don't try to witness, whenever I don't, I'm saying I don't 
care. I don't care that Jesus died for me. Don't care that Jesus died for them. Just don't care. My schedule is more important than their soul. So, are you apathetic? I know. These guys do this all the time. They talk about all this nonsense. I mean, you can almost see it in some guy's eyes as they sit there. It's like, come on. It's a fact. You have a fire in your heart for souls. You want to see people saved. Apathy. Amen. The Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I wonder what go ye means. Let's go to the original Greek. <laughs> what does go ye mean? It means you... Go! Oh. Now, who's you? Oh, it was the early church. It was the, the pastor, though. It's Christians. You, me, are commanded to go. God's not saying, hey, you know, if you get some time, if you can fit it in your schedule, you know? Try and find some time. To, yeah. He said, hey, yo. Remember, these are his last words before he left, before the ascension. The last words he says to us. You go. See, I wonder why I don't have any power. How come God's using those guys over there and he doesn't use me? Could it be that you're not going? You're not obedient? Hey, God, I want all your blessings, but don't give me this other stuff. Amen? <laughs> go. Go. You just need to go do it. What is the purpose for the existence of the church? Hmm? Why doesn't God simply snatch us up to heaven when we get saved? Man, wouldn't that be great? Son, that would have worked for me. Believe me. Because God has left us here to do his work in the fulfillment of of the Great Commission and to finish or continue the work that he started. Why did God come? According to Luke 19.10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Did he come to sing? Hmm? Did he come to... Uh, I don't know, dress up real pretty on Sunday and let everybody see. Did he come to do that? Did he come so we could just have a really good time? Why did Christ come to earth? To seek and to save that which is lost. Our problems, we get wrapped up into so many other things. We have so many other focuses. We forget what we're here for. No. Oh, uh, yes, I am a servant of God. I sing in the choir and I do special music. Oh, 
When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? Well, you don't understand. I practice and I sing and my music reaches hearts. And When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? I drive a bus. Oh, amen. When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? I, I asked a guy one time, hey, we were just talking, and, you know, oh, you know, I just have trouble talking to people. I said, well, I said, you're out on a bus route every weekend. What do you mean? Well, uh, my job is to drive the car. So I just drive around, drop people off. That's all I do. Well, hmm. You know, I drive a, I, I, my job is to drive the van on Tuesday nights. That's not my witnessing. That's me enabling you guys to witness. I have to go out on another night. I have to, through the day, be a witness. Amen? I, I, I can't say, oh, hey, I go on visitation on Tuesday nights and drive the van. I've done my duty. Well, that's Christian service, yeah. But that's not my soul in it. That's, that's not me being a witness. That's me driving a van. Hello. You understand what I'm saying? Seek and to save that which is lost. God has entrusting, entrusted the spreading of the gospel to us, to you and to me. He could have sent angels to do it, or he could have raised up supermen to do it. You know, he could have raised, but what does he do? He uses us. You and me. Do you know that there's people out there that are dependent upon you to tell them the gospel? And if you don't do it, they're not going to hear it. Well, somebody else will tell them. No, no, no. It was your responsibility. And if you don't tell them, they don't hear it. They die and go to hell. And it's your responsibility. The blood is on your hands. Period. Period. God gave us a responsibility. We need to become personal soul winners. I, I said before, we're going to focus on soul winning. We'll talk a little bit about visitation, and we'll talk about organized door knocking. We'll talk about altar work and working with children and stuff like that. But, but the greatest emphasis is just going to be personal evangelism, being opportunistic soul winners every chance you get being a witness to somebody. Whether it's a waitress in the restaurant, a lady standing in line at Walmart, somebody you just happen to bump into on the street, always looking for an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Amen? Hungry for it. And by the way, I'm not talking about a, hey, 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 how many people here want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. None of you guys want to go to heaven? All right. How many people want to go to heaven? Okay, bow your heads and repeat after me. One, two, three, Jesus loves me. Amen. I just led 30 people to the Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? You give me a piece of candy, and a four-year-old kid, I can have a profession of faith in five minutes. Amen. Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying four-year-olds can't get saved. But that's what a lot of us do. You don't, you don't want to go to hell, do you? All you have to do is say this prayer. And, and, amen. Um, just chant after me. Something about believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. And how can they believe if they've not heard? 
I mean, a Hindu, I could, you know, give me a little bit of time with a Hindu, man. He'll have a plastic Jesus up there next to Buddha. Boom. But he's not saved. So think about that. Why personal evangelism? You know, we hear so much about visitation programs and organized visitation. What is so special about personal soul winning? Why the emphasis? You know, there are many people who get one to the Lord during visitation. I'm not, I mean, we need to be door knocking. But what happens often is it's simply going out and inviting people to come to church or, or truly just going out and visiting with them. The first church that I was in, I, right after I got saved, I went out on visitation with one of the deacons. I mean, that's what Christians do. I wanted to tell people about the Lord. Amen. I showed up on Thursday night. I'm going so winning. Oh, no, I wasn't visitating. Hi, we're from Baptist Church. We'd like you to come to church. Thank you. And we walked away. Just get them to church. It's the pastor's job to tell them about Jesus. Uh-huh. What if they don't come to church? We did our part. Our hands are clean. I said, no, we didn't. They're talking about Jesus, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I, I'm not knocking visitation if it's done right. The problem is it not a lot of times it's just simply and you leave. You never ask him, you know, are you twenty five percent, fifty percent, hundred percent certain something happened to you tonight, you'd go to heaven. Oh, really? And on you go. You're telling them about Jesus. Personal confrontational soul winning is the best best method for winning the lost. Okay? Personal confrontational soul winning is the best method for winning the lost. It is how the majority of people get saved. Okay? It's how the majority, but what makes it so effective? I'm glad you ask. Number one, anybody can do it. What makes personal confrontational soul winning so much more effective? Number one, anybody can do it. You don't need any special training. None at all. I, I, I like, my favorite line is, are you saved? Yes. Were you there when it happened? Well, Yes then all you're doing is telling somebody what you did. That's all it is. You know, there was a time in my life when, when I was empty, something was missing, and I looked everywhere for it, and I couldn't find it. And then one day, somebody cared enough about me that they took the time to show me what the Bible says, what I need. And I'm so glad that I wasn't a smart aleck, but I listened to him. Amen? And why does it work so well? Why can anybody do it? You're telling them what happened to you. And there's a sincerity to that. Amen? I think about when I got saved. And by the way, how often do you think about when you got saved? Mm. Man, I tell you what. (laughs) I've had some great things happen in my life. Nothing like getting saved. And I mean that. You know, I know it sounds stupid, but I really was lost. Hey, man, I knew I was lost. And somebody showed me how I could be saved. Amen. 
That's important. Think about that. And then tell somebody else. Anybody can do it. Little girls. Little girls can do it. Old men can do it. You don't have to be especially intelligent to do it. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to be fluent or a great speaker. Anybody can do it. It's the sincerity. It's the, this is what's happened. Amen. Secondly, you can do it anywhere. It can be done at work during a break. It can be done in a restaurant. It can be done in the street. It can be done in the home. It can be done in a plane. It can be done standing at the gas pump. It can be done anywhere. It can be done in a foxhole. It can be done in the woods. It can be done in the city. It can be done anywhere. So anybody can do it. And it can be done anywhere. Hey, I mean, hey, stop and think about some of the places you've led somebody to the Lord. Strange places. Sitting in the barracks. Sitting in a classroom. Sitting in a church. On the beach. In the car. On the bus. You can do it anywhere. Anywhere. So wow, anybody can do you, anybody can do it, and it can be done anywhere. And number three, it can be done anytime. Morning, noon, or night. At lunch, standing in line at Walmart. <laughs> anytime. Not just Sunday morning, not just Thursday night. Any time. You can't pick a time that you couldn't lead somebody to the Lord. So anybody can do it anywhere, anytime. Wow. See, a lot of people think uh, Thursday nights. Mm, Thursday morning works. Saturday afternoon. Friday at midnight. Amen. But what's the trick? It's learning to look at people as a soul with a body attached to it. Amen. Stay soul conscious. Always prepared. Always wanting to tell somebody about the Lord. Man, have you ever been around one of them guys? Every time you start talking to them, they want to talk about Jesus. <sighs> I know people with that attitude. I know students with that attitude. Man, every time you talk to them, they want to talk about Jesus. Do <laughs> I mean, you, know, you know how I tell who my friends are? My real friends. And I mean this, I'm telling you. My closest, truest friends, and I can name them on this hand, I don't care what the discussion starts with. Do you know where we always end up? Ain't God good. <laughs> you know what God's doing, man. Wow. What are we going to do for God? How's God working in our life? What's God doing with our children? What's God? We always wind up talking about God. That's my friends. I, you know, they come over to the house for coffee. Nine times out of ten, we wind up on our knees somewhere going, Oh, God, please! You know, hey, that's your friends. Stay soul conscious. Huh? Sitting at McDonald's, the waitress walks up. That, we got that on there. But she's a Christian. But she, how do we know she's a Christian? Because the first time she walked up to us, we started witnessing to her. That's how we know she's a Christian. 
Are you embarrassed if you're out with somebody and they start witnessing the people around you? Oh, man, I need to come on. I'm trying to eat. We're trying to bowl. We're trying to whatever. I'm telling you. I ain't going to hang around with your man. He's a dry. Every time you go with him, he's trying to. <laughs> Just came to go out and have a good time. Hmm? Of course, I know none of you guys here have that attitude. I, I'm sorry. Forgive me. None of us would ever be like that. Soul conscious. Anyone can do it. It can be done anywhere. It can be done anytime. Number four, it reaches all classes. Rich or poor, ignorant or educated. The drunk behind the liquor store or the rich man at the back, at the bank. Personal, confrontational, soul winning works regardless of a person's station in life. It reaches all classes. Ignorance or a lack of education should never be worn as a badge of pride by us, by the way. Nobody will listen to you if you parade your ignorance in front of them. You need to learn as much as you possibly can. And since that we happen to be living in America, you probably should learn to speak the English language as it should be spoken. You ever been around somebody that just, they won't speak? Don't, don't pride yourself on your ignorance. Bless God, I never took an English class in my life. Don't know grammar if I tripped over it. God will use you. Amen. But don't use education as a badge either. Well, I'm just so much smarter than you. I know all of these words like, oh, propitiation and... You got to look who you're talking to. Okay? Paul said that to the Jew, he'd be a Jew. Right? He's going to be all things to all men that, by whatever means, he'd be able to reach him. Right? And do you know rich people need Jesus? I know this will come as a surprise. Yeah. Well, I don't like to go door knocking in those expensive neighborhoods. Why not? Because you're not interested in souls. You're interested in numbers. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I like seeing people saved, and I like. I like going into the poor neighborhoods. Yes, I do. They are much more receptive. But their receptivity does nothing to do with my responsibility on telling people about Jesus. And I got to tell the rich man as much as I got to tell the poor guy. And the rich man might sick his dog on me or have his butler slam the door in my face or whatever they might do. But I still have a responsibility to tell them about Jesus. Just a thought. It reaches all classes. Number five, it hits the mark. It hits the mark. Preaching is general. People take it and pass it on to everybody else. Now, I know none of you guys would ever do this, but you're sitting in a church sermon, or you're sitting in church, and this guy's preaching. I mean, he's just up there, and he's hammering, spitting, slobbering, and goes, there, and you're thinking, boy, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. They really need it. Like you don't? <laughs> but that's the problem, you know? I mean, uh, you can sit there and go, oh, that's not me. That's somebody else. Yes. Yeah, so, hey, 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 hey. Personal confrontational soul one, and I'm looking you right in the eye saying, did you know that if you don't know how Jesus is Savior, you will spend an eternity in hell? 
Amen. Boom. Boom. Me, me? I'm a sinner. Now, one-on-one -on -one makes it personal. It brings it straight to them. It makes them look at themselves because there's another individual looking them in the face. And they know that you're talking to them. Not them. You're talking to me. And it just, it's right there. You know, the message, the gospel never changes. But how we present it does. Okay? The gospel and the message is the same. But if I'm sitting with a banker, I don't have my hands in my pocket going, yeah, well, y'all, you know, I mean, you know. What? Yeah. Yeah, we went to church up there. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, we ate the possum. I wouldn't do that with a banker. But I've been... Anybody here ever eat goat? Mm. Went to Georgia. And the fellow says, hey man, you got to come over here. We got a Spanish, got a bunch of Spanish people over here. They need witness to. I said, okay, let's go. And we went over there and, and I stood around and I witnessed to them and we preached to them. And then they took us in their house and man, they pulled a goat leg up out of this great big old pot. Still had hair on it. I ain't kidding you, you know. Put it on my plate. And I went, mmm, thank you. And I ate that puppy. And you get to the end, the plate's got like a little bowl in it, and everybody goes, so you know what I did? Amen. When I was in Haiti, I ate chicken's feet. I've had tripe, yes. Why? Why would you do something like that? So I'd have a chance to witness to him. So I'd have a chance to sit there and, and talk to him, tell him about Jesus. Amen. You too good to eat chicken feet? Too good to eat a goat? I'd, I'd eat a fish head if I thought it'd give me a chance to witness somebody. I'd leave very quickly thereafter. You know, oh, they just gotta go. <laughs> I'm sorry. What I'm trying to tell you is, hits the mark. I mean, I, you can witness to anybody, and you got to be willing to witness to anybody. But Dr. Lewis, he smells funny. You know what? You probably smell funny to him. Did you ever think about that? He doesn't dress like me. So, well, amen. I could see Jesus getting off the boat at Gadarene going, Oh, wait! Hey, go away and get dressed and come back and I'll tell you about Jesus. <laughs> what did he do? He got the guy saved and the next thing you know, he's sitting at his feet clothed. Amen? I'm not there to put clothes on you. I'm there to tell you about Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit will take care of that. Amen? Amen? amen. I worked, man, there was a couple of us, we worked for months to get a guy into church. And he got to the back of the church and had an earring in. Now, I, I'm not for earrings. But some dear saint met him at the back of the church. Do the homosexuals wear their earring in the left ear or the right ear? Oh, you're only that far from being a queer, you know. I'm not for earrings. But I'm going to get the guy saved and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do something. Amen. Get him under the preaching of the word and let God. What am I there for? Dress them up and get their earrings off of them? Man, I don't care if he comes to church wearing mascara. Amen. Amen. I'm there telling about Jesus. 
And I can look them in the face. I don't care what they're wearing. Tell them about Jesus. Hits the mark. Hits the mark. Hits the mark. Amen? What are you there for? Man, to get them a bath? Hello? You smell funny. You go get a bath and then I'll tell you about Jesus. You know what? If we could see ourselves the way God saw us before we got saved, I don't care if you were wearing a three-piece suit. You know what you are? Vile. Until you're washed in the blood. Hits the mark. Hits the mark. Okay? Number six, it meets a definite need. It meets a definite need. Preaching convicts hearts, but a lot of times preachers are trying to scratch people where they don't have an itch. You understand what I'm saying? Once again, because it's an individual witnessing to an individual, you can tailor delivery to meet the individual's needs. Whether it's a single unwed mom or a drunk or a teenager looking for something, personal confrontational soul winning meets their individual need. Amen? The illustrations I use, the way that I talk to a person, okay? It depends upon what their need. Now, they all have the same basic need. They need Jesus Christ. But you talk to a young unwed mother a lot differently than you talk to an old drunk. Or do you talk to just a rebellious teen? Or you talk to a man and a wife that are really just doing pretty good and everything's, they're just lost and on their way to hell. Amen? Jesus loves you. Jesus can forgive you. Amen? Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus died for your sins. Amen? Jesus loves you. And you can meet that need with Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, you know, I've been a drunk for 60 years. So? Jesus can save you. But you don't know... (laughs) What, three weeks now, almost a month, Kim, sitting in my office one Thursday, about 10 o'clock in the morning. My dad called. But my dad doesn't really call me a lot. I talk to him every week one way or the other. But, but he called me, and when I answered the phone, he's crying like a baby, sobbing. And that's not my dad. It scared me. I thought somebody died or there had been something, you know. Because my dad had just had major, major surgery about a month prior to this. And they, you know, I mean, they they had told him equal chances it'll fix you, paralyze you, or kill you. But he he had to have the neck surgery. I mean, they went went through here and did all of this stuff. But but he's, I mean, just, I'm thinking, oh. It just scared me to death. I was like, Dad, what's the matter? He said, I had to talk to you, son. I said, well, what's up? What's the matter? He said, I was sitting here thinking about all the terrible things I've done in my life, thinking about what I've done and how bad I've been, and, and I just had to get right with God. I said, Dad, did you ask Jesus to come into your heart and forgive you? Have you asked him to save you? I just did it. And I had to tell you. Man. I spent the rest of the day with tears rolling down my face. But witnessing to him, witnessing to him, witnessing to him, witnessing to him. And, and finally him sitting there thinking. dad got saved. 
One, you know, it, it didn't. I tell him the gospel. He got saved. Anyway, twenty-five years I prayed for my dad. My dad got saved. Okay, it meets an individual need. He had to, it. It had to be right there. You understand what I'm saying? Number seven. It produces the largest results. It's the simplest way of sharing the gospel. It produces the largest results. More people are one to the Lord this way than any other method. Because it's personal and it can be done anytime, anywhere, by anybody. It just naturally produces more results. If, if, it's only, if people are only getting saved on Sunday morning during the church service or Thursday night during a visitation, but think Christians in their multiplied thousands every day telling somebody about Jesus at every opportunity. It just naturally produces more results. Amen? How about if every one of us won one? If we said, this week, I'm going to win one. I'm going to win one. I'm not talking about every day. I'm just saying, if you get down on your knees and start praying, Lord, let me win somebody this week. Lord, every week, let me lead somebody to the Lord. Win one, win one, win one. Glendy Hamilton. Lord, I make a vow with you that I... If you enable me, we'll lead somebody to the Lord every day. And he doesn't go to bed until he's led somebody to the Lord. Of course, he's over on Paramore. And, you know, that's like the fields are white unto harvest. Amen. But every day. I mean, that's what he spends time every day out looking for a chance to lead somebody to the Lord. Everyone win one. A lot of results, right? Amen. If we won one every week, there's what, 30 of us in here? 30 times 52? That'd be a bunch of people. And how about if we taught them to win one? Amen? And I hear people, so it must be time. <laughs>